Hello and welcome to this month's WorkRight webinar on food safety. I'm Chris Jones, Technical Director at Posturite and joined as usual by Ellie Hale, our Business Development Manager for WorkRight. Hello Ellie. Hello. Hi, uh, I did spend hours looking for a good joke related to food safety today but was left a little bit wanting. Clearly food safety is no joke. Um, so Ellie, what are you going to be taking us through today? <laughs> What? Did you actually just say a joke, or did yeah, you miss that, the joke? That, 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 that was my attempt at light, making that food safety light-hearted and uh, in, interesting. So um, <laughs> uh, I don't know how well I did, but um, uh, anyway, we've got a new new course in food safety, which is actually a very exciting new subject for us, and it's slightly um, sort of off-piece for us. Normally, it's um, sort of office health and safety related stuff but we've gone sort of expanded our horizons a little bit now and looking at uh, food safety as well so um, uh, Ellie I hopefully you're going to tell us all about it today. Yeah I just pulled myself together after your joke there actually. <laughs> um, very funny. So yeah so welcome to our brand new food safety course as, as Chris said completely different for us. This is a ROSPA approved course and um, suitable for any businesses really wanting to ensure that their staff have got a, a basic level of food and safety. Um, we have three different um, variations of the course. We've got a level one, so that's for people that anyone, for any people that may come into contact with food. So it's very important, generally, like any offices with kitchens, um, really you should be ensuring your staff have got a basic level of food safety. Um, and level two is for anybody directly involved in the food prep. Um, we have two versions of level two, one for catering and one for retail. So I'm going to run through food safety level one with you. And as always, please get in touch with us with your feedback because we love to know what you think. So going through the legislation, the Food, Sta safety, the food Standards Agency is an independent government agency that is responsible for enforcing, advising and supporting in matters of food safety and hygiene. There is enforced legislation that covers all aspects of food safety, from production, processing, packaging and labelling, through to importing, distribution, retail and catering. This course will help you to understand and apply best practice in line with relevant food and safety laws. And I'll let you know the relevant legislation just there. If you work with food or around food, you have responsibility to ensure that the food served to your customers is safe to eat. Food safety is not difficult but it requires that you understand the hazards and how to control them. You also need to use common sense, be disciplined and conscientious. The course will introduce proven methods to control risks to food safety and protect the well-being of your customers, not just customers, also colleagues. Um, you don't have to be in the food prepare, in the kitchen preparing food to be considered a food handler. If you work in an environment where food is served or prepared, it's likely that um, at one time or another you may serve food to customers, serve drinks to customers, touch services that will come into contact with food, touch equipment used to prepare or serve food such as knives, bowls or plates. You are a food handler if you work in an area where food is prepared. So here we go guys, I've got a little poll for you. The Food Standards Agency researches the number of food poisoning cases each year in the UK. How many cases of food poisoning do you think occur in the UK each year? Is it 5,000? Is it 50,000? Is it 500,000? Oh, that's a tricky one. I guess uh, at some point in uh, a lot of people's uh, year, they perhaps blame food poisoning for why they're feeling so dodgy the day after. I know I have. Um, but I, I guess... <laughs> yeah. Uh, reported uh, reported food poisoning cases. Oh, I'm. I mean, I would have thought it's got to be. It can't be five hundred thousand. And five thousand seems a bit low. So I would say fifty thousand. If I was going to take a punt, Ellie, how about you? I'm going to go five hundred thousand actually. Okay. Okay. Let's have a look what everybody else thought. Hold on. So sixty-three percent of us thought fifty thousand, uh, a few at five thousand, and a few at five hundred thousand. So um, why don't you reveal what what it actually was then, Ellie? So okay. what do you reckon fifty thousand? That's incorrect. The number of food poisoning cases is even higher than that. An estimated five hundred thousand cases of food poisoning are caused by known pathogens each year. Wow! This figure That's would double if it included unknown pathogens. Well, there you wow. go. That's a, that's, a, that's a huge amount. 
hefty number. Um, both businesses and individuals can be prosecuted for breaching food safety laws. Conviction in a magistrate's court can result in a fine of up to £5,000. But what do you think the maximum penalty is for a Crown Court conviction? Is it six months imprisonment? Is it one year imprisonment? Is it two years imprisonment? And or an unlimited fine? Okay, okay, well, I've launched the poll again, two in a row. Um, so, uh, I mean, people can die. I, I, I'm going go, to go with right. two, two years and, 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 and or an unlimited fine, I, I'm guessing. I, I'd imagine it's fairly okay. serious, depending upon exactly what's occurred. You know, I'm yeah. guessing there is a there's a, a spectrum here and um, uh, but yeah I, I'm gonna go with that so let's see what, what everybody else reason? thought 100% of us all thought that third option um, so uh, yeah and that's correct the maximum penalty for breaching food safety laws is two years imprisonment and a potentially unlimited fine so this course is going to show you how to protect your customers yourself and your employer from the consequences of poor food safety practice Hazards to food safety come from contamination. Contaminants can be organised into four main types. Microbiological. Um, bacteria are microbiological organisms. I'm trying to say that very carefully. Uh, that is, living creatures that are too small to see without a microscope. While some bacteria are harmless and even beneficial, others present a danger to food safety. These bacteria are responsible for food poisoning and are known as pathogens. Other undesirable forms of bacteria can cause food to spoil. Disorganised working practices and untidy environments can lead to the physical contamination of food. Physical contaminants that have been found in food can, can include metal bolts. Tiny pieces of metal from worn out cookware can also find their way into food and cause illness. Chemical contaminants include cleaning products such as detergents and disinfectants. If these aren't stored and used correctly, they can contaminate food and drink. Other chemical contaminants include pesticides, fly spray, hairspray and nail varnish. These can have dangerous consequences if they find their way into food. Care and vigilance are required. I remember working in a kitchen and I had to take my nail polish off. Um, keep allergenic ingredients separate from other ingredients. So allergens include uh, nuts including peanuts, milk, eggs, soybeans, lupin, and fi fish and shellfish. An allergic reaction can cause a person to enter anaphylactic shock. This is a life-threatening condition and makes it difficult to breathe. Call the emergency services immediately if this happens. So um, just going over what we've learned, what are the four types of food hazard? Is it macrobiological, physical, chemical, allergenic? Is it microbiological, physical, chemical, allergenic? Is it mitochondrial, physical, chemical, allergenic? Oh. Let's open that Sorry. bowl. There we go. Uh, Sorry, Ellie. I was—I uh, clicked the wrong button and I uh, jumped all over the place. Can you? Can you? Uh, ev excellent. Everyone can see that now, and we've got some votes coming in. And I was listening carefully for once, as often um, uh, uh, I don't. But I reckon it was microbiological, and then the other three are all the same, aren't they? So micro microbiological, physical, chemical, and allergenic. Uh, do you I agree, do Ellie? I do, I do. Also, Chris, is your phone going off? Because it, it's sounding a bit fuzzy. I have just thrown it away. Sorry about that, uh, <laughs> Ellie. So, that, that is correct. There we go. Well done. Food hazards can be grouped into four main categories. And I don't need to say them again because I don't think I can cope with saying all those words again. Um, so, what do you reckon, guys? If you only prepare and serve drinks to customers, you do not need food safety training. Do you reckon that's true or do you reckon that's false? Okay. Just drinks. I, oh, I don't know. I, I feel like you probably do still need some some training. Um, yeah, do the guys agree with you? No, actually, if we look at the uh, the results here, 88% uh, think it's false. Um, and so I, uh, along with a, a few of us, 13% of us thought it was true, so um, I, think, I, I think 
That is correct. Well done. Well done, everybody. You there we are, guys. Me. If you prepare and serve drinks for customers, you must ensure that the drinks are safe to consume and food safety law still applies. What's wrong with this scene, guys? Take a look at the bar opposite. Can you see a potential hazard? We've got all of these drinks along here. I'm going to guess that you've all spotted the insect Huge, spray. It should not be stored among items of food or drink, but it could accidentally be served or consumed or contaminate food if used. And then just a summary of what we've learned there. Now let's go on to more microbiological hazards. So food hygiene include bacteria and the toxins they produce, as well as viruses, yeasts and moulds and parasites. Bacteria can spoil food and lead to food poisoning. This section will give you an understanding of the conditions bacteria need to survive and reproduce and how they are spread. This knowledge will explain many of the rules in kitchens and food businesses. Bacteria that cause food poisoning can make a person seriously ill and even result in death. The elderly, pregnant women, babies and children, and those with a weakened immune system are especially at risk. In 2014, 500 people are thought to have died from food poisoning in the UK. Onset times vary, but those suffering from food poisoning experience symptoms within 24 hours. Bacteria are everywhere, in the air, on surfaces, on animals, in our breath, on our skin, and inside our bodies. There are two types of bacteria that food businesses must contain. These are spoilage bacteria. And they consume food, excrete waste, and then reproduce in it. Ugh. This causes food to taste bad, smell bad, and discolour. Spoilage bacteria don't cause illness. They render the food inedible and contaminate the environment. Customers serve food contaminated with spoilage bacteria will have a very bad dining experience. And bacteria that cause illness are called pathogens. Pathogens do not produce any clues that they're present. Unlike spoilage bacteria, they don't alter the taste, texture, or appearance of food. An item of food contaminating with contaminated with pathogens may look and taste right yet may be dangerous to consume. There's no practical way of determining whether an item of food contains pathogens. The only safeguard is to know that a proper procedure has been followed. Bacteria reproduce when individual cells divide into two. Certain conditions are needed for bacteria to do this. They need warmth, time, food and moisture. Bacteria will spread quickly if measures aren't taken to control them. Bacteria depend on a temperature range of 6 to 63 degrees Celsius to thrive. This range is known as the danger zone. By controlling temperature, the amount of bacteria in the food can be kept at or reduced to safe levels. There are two strategies for achieving this. That's freezing and chilling and cooking. In suitable conditions, food poisoning bacteria double every 10 to 20 minutes. Imagine a piece of raw meat is left on a counter at room temperature. How many bacteria will be present after one hour if bacteria double every 20 minutes? Okay, Ellie, I am going to launch the. I have just launched the okay. poll. However, the answer. Well, the answers here differ from um, the answers yeah. that were just on your screen. So uh, we don't uh, have I'm, this poll um, on the poll. Okay. Unfortunately, okay. then we're going to have to leave that one. Or do you think it's eight times as many? Oh, well, it's going to have to be eight times as many. Um, yeah. So, so, sorry, audience, you've missed out on that one. But also. Um, the next one that comes up, we are Ellie. Just so you're aware, we're going to have to skip as well because I've launched it and closed it. We we cannot relaunch no. it. So <laughs> just so you know, um, wow. Everyone so it's calm doubling. down. It's okay. It was oh, never in the script to have a poll for this one. <laughs> so it um, doubles so every okay, twenty guys. minutes. It does, leading to eight times as many bacterial cells present wow. in the food after one hour. Ugh, food poisoning is horrific. Um, bacteria breed rapidly in food that are rich in protein and are moist. Here are some common high-risk foods. Meat, such as chicken, beef, lamb, pork, ham, turkey, duck. Meat products like sausages, hamburgers, dairy like milk, cream, eggs and cheese. Oh, and fish and shellfish. That's a biggie. Um, food containing starch like rice and couscous. Bacteria thrive on food that's high in protein and moist. It doesn't have to be covered in juice. Raw chicken is a good example. 
In fact, 65% of chickens for sale in the UK are contaminated with the bacteria Campylobacter, which can cause food poisoning if food safety procedures are not followed. And then it's going to go through, I'm just going to whiz through these guys. You can always ask for a demo if you want to learn more about the specific kinds of bacteria. But there's a key tip with each of them to trying to avoid it. So what's wrong with this scene? Take a look at the kitchen counter. Chris, what's wrong? What's going on here? Oh, well, it looks it looks like a bit of a mess at first glance. Um, so there's stuff in stuff in the sink going on there. There's what is there meat and vegetables close to each other as well, perhaps? Um, <laughs> I, think, I think you can keep meat and, meat and vegetables close. But there's some knives, isn't there? We don't know what there's sauce some knives, is there. Knives, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the I generally, I the plate of meat looking lonely. Yeah, I mean, I I just say at first glance, I'd say. For starters, it's a bit of a mess. But a, ah, here we go. So, a high um, risk food should not be left on the counter. A warm ambient temperature will allow bacteria to multiply rapidly. Remember, pathogens don't give a visible sign that they're present in food, and, and bacteria needs warmth, time, food, and moisture to grow. So, we're going to have a little look at cross contamination, which is the what. Um, Poll that we've missed. How many bacteria do you think are present on each square centimetre of your hand? Well, a few of us got in quite early actually, and, and, and the, the few seconds that I launched that poll, actually 100% voted for 1500 as well, so they yeah, obviously know food safety insulin out. So. Square centimetre of your hand. It's surprising, isn't it? That's why don't touch your face with your hands, don't touch anything with your hands. Always wear gloves, whatever you're doing. Cross-contamination occurs when an object comes into contact with bacteria and then is used for another purpose without being cleaned. Uh, for example, a knife is used to chop raw chicken and then the same knife used to dice a salad and that will spread the bacteria from the chicken to the salad. Gross. So it's important to avoid cross-contaminating cooked and ready-to-eat foods. These foods, such as salads and cold meats, won't undergo further processes to kill or control the bacteria. So, which of the following is a ready-to-eat food? Raw beef, salami, kidney beans, or frozen prawns? Well, I'm pretty certain salami, because I eat a lot of salami straight out of the fridge, take it out of the fridge, chop a little bit off, don't tell my wife, um, and the salami <laughs> gets smaller, because <laughs> it's just so addictive. Um, I don't think I've ever done that with a frozen prawn out of the freezer. No, I don't um, do that. Raw, raw beef an interesting one though, because there is there, there there is you know there are varieties of beef which I believe is raw that you eat. Um, yeah. But I, I and I like my my steak pretty much mooing still as well, but um, it has still been cooked. Tartar, so isn't that how you say it? If it's raw beef. Yeah, or like just I mean, yeah, I think that's I think that might be slightly different, but um. But it was salami be, we were going for. It's you gotta be right. salami, isn't it? And a hundred percent of us. preparation. So you've got to be, you've got to be, if it's ready to eat, you've got to be really careful that it doesn't become contaminated because it's not going to go, undergo any more processes. Absolutely. <clears throat> so colour coding to stop bacteria spreading from high risk foods to cooked and ready to eat foods, you can use colour coding. Here are some common examples: on the chopping boards and on the knives. These examples demonstrate one colour coding convention. Your workplace may use a different system. Colour coding ensures that utensils used for one purpose are never reused for another and therefore don't cross-contaminate. With this in mind, it's important not to use items from the kitchen in other areas and vice versa. Colour coding isn't much use if you store and prepare high-risk foods along cooked and ready-to-eat foods. Above all, it's essential to keep raw meat and poultry separate from ready-to-eat foods. Everybody should be doing this in their fridges at home. And then it's going to take you through the right processes for delivery, cold storage, defrosting, and your food prep. Keep allergenic ingredients separate from other ingredients to prevent cross-contamination. You've got a legal responsibility to warn customers about the following allergenic ingredients. This warning could be present on the menu, on the wall, or told to the customer by serving staff. So those are allergens derived from plants and allergens derived from animals, and also chemical allergens. 
You've got a duty to let customers know what ingredients are in the food you serve. An allergic reaction to an ingredient is potentially fatal. So you must know your ingredients. Um, be aware of the allergenic cross-contamination. And also be really clear on the menu. Cloths are one of the major causes of cross-contamination in kitchens. So use disposable cloths where possible. Use a fresh cloth to wipe services, equipment and utensils. And wash and disinfect reusable cloths after each task and wash them in a washing machine at 82 degrees Celsius or higher. You should limit the amount of food you prepare at any one time and keep ingredients covered. The two benefits are it prevents cross-contamination between ingredients and it limits the amount of time ingredients spend in the danger zone. Imagine your workplace has the following colour code systems. Red chopping boards for raw meat, red knives for raw meat, yellow chopping boards for cooked meat, yellow knives for cooked meat, and green for cleaning equipment. Take a look at the scene opposite and see if you can spot what's wrong. <coughs> okay. Um, well, I can see a chicken. I, I think it's raw, and that's on a red chopping board. Ah, but what could I see next to that red chopping board? Looks like a yellow knife. Um, Absolutely. And the yellow handled knife is for cooked meat, and there's a risk of cross contamination if someone uses it. Remember to keep foods at different, st at different stages of preparation separate. Raw meat and poultry must be kept away from cooked and ready to eat foods. And then we're going to talk about cleaning. So, what do you reckon, guys? A chopping board has twice as many bacteria than the average toilet seat. Is that true or false? Okay, let's launch the poll. Oh, I'm sure I've heard a um, a, a, a rumour about the number of bacteria on, on, a, on a toilet seat, but do you know what? I think it was something along the lines of actually what's underneath your fingernails is worse oh, God, than it just it's what's in a toilet seat. Oh, God, so, um, I, I we're going to go with true, are we? I, I think we're going to go with true, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and the key tip, does everyone every, say the same? Everybody said the same, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the key tip is to replace chopping boards that are scored or damaged because bacteria can live and breed in those grooves. So the stages here are cleaning, rinsing, disinfect, the final rinse, and then dry, remembering to keep chemicals away from the food. Cleaning is a good way to prevent physical contaminants finding their way into food. A dirty, cluttered, disorganised environment increases the risk that foreign objects can enter food unnoticed. For example, when a glass is broken, there's no way of telling if food's contaminated with these fragments. For this reason, many kitchens have a no glass rule. So. To keep your workspace clear and hygienic, remove outer packaging outside. Dispose of raw food packaging so it doesn't contaminate. Keep your work area tidy and organised. Don't let dirty dishes become a breed breeding ground. Wash up, uh, clean up spills straight away and dispose of waste food immediately. So do scheduled cleaning as well. Things that need a scheduled clean are the items that food touches, items that people touch, um, specific areas, and refrigerators and freezers. So can you remember what the five stages of cleaning are? Which of the following is right? Was it disinfect, rinse, clean with detergent, rinse and dry? Was it rinse, clean with detergent, rinse, disinfect and dry? Was it clean with detergent, rinse, disinfect, rinse, dry? All the rinsing. Anybody? Oh, well, well, uh, dry definitely goes at the end, Ellie. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it is number four. Num number two, I'd say, is rinse it first, make the detergent, rinse again, disinfect and dry. But it's a split opinion, though. Um, so I think most of us have voted now. And do you know what? I don't know if I've influenced it, but we have a tie. So 44% think option two and 44% 
option three with 11 percent thinking but it's you option thought option one. two didn't you i thought option two so let's oh, hide God. hole and see you were wrong it was clean wrong. with detergent rinse ah. disinfect rinse and dry excellent I interesting so here we go guys this was red chopping boards for raw meat red knives for raw meat green for kitchen cleaning equipment red for toilet cleaning equipment and what has happened in the scene opposite oh well there's a red bucket in the kitchen yeah. um, it doesn't look like it's in the right Absolutely. place to me and that's supposed to just be in the loo it probably spread dangerous bacteria all over the kitchen floor so guys remember the five stages of cleaning and then we're going to talk about chilling not relaxing but chilling um, bacteria need warmth time food and moisture we know that so this section is outlining the best practice for chilling freezing and defrosting so which of the following foods should be kept chilled is it a sandwich a loaf of bread fruit or potatoes Oh, um, I'm just trying to think what I put in my fridge. We don't put potatoes in the fridge or a loaf of bread. Sandwich, I guess, is prepared food and it might have anything in it. It could have prawns in it, which we've learned yeah. earlier is a definite no no. And fruit, we keep on the kitchen table. And obviously, this is at home rather than a, a, a workplace or, or shop. We but go it's, for the sun, it's got, got to be sandwich, isn't it? Let's have a look what everybody yeah, thought. Exactly, because it's prepared and is ready to eat. Correct. And, and a filling may be at risk of contamination. I think we've got that spot on then, and 100% of us all thought the same. Well done, gang. So, refrigerators should be kept between 0 and 5 degrees Celsius. Outside of the... Danger zone! Danger zone. <laughs> Freezer units should store foods at minus 18 degrees Celsius to stop bacterial growth. And you need to think about that when accepting deliveries and also when possible freeze food in small portions because they freeze and defrost quickly so in terms of stock management you need to think about first in first out you need to think about the use by dates and the best before dates you must reject unsatisfactory goods and make sure that you don't overfill the cold storage um, display units often have an open front and may not chill food as effectively as other types of refrigeration. You must keep food on display chilled to 8 degrees Celsius or lower. And some more information just here. Cool hot food rapidly. Don't put hot food directly into the fridge freezer. It can raise the temperature inside the unit and spread bacteria faster the food cools the sooner it can be placed into the fridge so divide it into smaller portions cover pans and move them into a cold room or stand them in cold water stir the food to allow the heat to escape use the cool setting on your oven or use a blast chiller and there's some information about defrosting so let's have a look inside this fridge opposite what issues can you see Chris what do you reckon? Oh, um, well, the meat is on the raw meat is on top of the cake. That's got to be a no-no, along with it's along with the fish great. there. I think I think that well, that's the, that's got to be something a bit mouldy here. P possibly, but is that cheese? Is that cheese? And is it is supposed it to be uh, mouldy cheese? I don't, I don't know. Well, I, I, there's I, a problem I, with the temperature. Is it six degrees? Ah, six danger, degrees. Danger. Danger. So there we go. Back into the danger zone. Raw meat shouldn't be stored above cooked or ready to eat foods. Um, yeah, something a bit, yeah, it was mouldy. Well, well past to use by date. And the temperature in the fridge is above. Basically, budget. we're in a lot of trouble if we get anywhere near that fridge. It was, but luckily we spotted it all. Excellent. And then some info on cooking. About cooking temperatures. Uh, if food reaches 75 degrees Celsius throughout for 30 seconds, all pathogens should die or be deactivated. Um, in Scotland, food must be heated to 82 uh, degrees Celsius by law. 
Um, which of the following methods is the best way to check that the correct temperature has been reached at the centre of the food? Should you use a digital handheld thermometer, use a glass mercury thermometer, or just open the food and check with your finger? Well, um, I'm pretty sure glass mercury thermometers, I don't think they're even legal anymore. Are they mercury's poisonous, isn't it? And, yeah. <laughs> and, and we've agreed earlier that glass does not belong in the kitchen, so I'm going to yeah. strike that one out straight away. And we also know that hands are filthy. Yeah, checking with your finger might might not might not pass the sort of food standards agencies. Uh, does everyone does everyone agree with us? Digital I handheld. I think one hundred percent have gone for the handheld thermometer. That's good. Um, there we go, because a glass assume... mercury thermometer could break, and using your finger could spread harmful bacteria. Excellent. Well done, gang. Ensuring food are cooked. So, following guidance for specific foods here. I'm just going to whiz through these. Bear with me. It's a delicious bit of pizza now. Um, hot holding is the practice of keeping food at 63 degrees Celsius or above until you're ready to serve it. This is hot enough to prevent bacteria reaching dangerous levels. Some information about equipment like a bain marie or a soup kettle but you can display it as we said um, but it's not a cooking process it must be cooked and piping hot before hot holding Refe reheating food um, it means cooking it again it's not sufficient just to warm it up um, you must reheat only once um, you should preheat equipment before reheating and stir the food as appropriate What's going on in this scene here? Is well, the turkey ready looks... to eat yet? It's been cooking for 40 minutes. Yeah, we've, well, we've used a digital thermometer, which is good, but I'm not sure it's reached the right temperature yet. There we go, no. With its core heated to 60 degrees Celsius, the turkey will need to be cooked for at least 45 minutes to reduce the pathogens to a safe level. A little bit premature. And then there's a summary. Last one, guys. So, this is about hygiene and housekeeping. Teaching people proper hand washing techniques can reduce instances of diarrhea by 31% and common colds by 21%. Oh, sorry, hang on. There we go. Um, I'm going to go with true. I would have thought true. Um, and That's true. Washing hands is very effective at reducing illness. Excellent. Um, and everybody, apart from apart from a few, agreed with that as well. But I, I guess there's, you could perhaps argue over the percentages, but it's... Uh, there we go. Good work. And this section is all about hygiene and housekeeping. just want to go through the summary. here. So here we go, guys. What is the temperature range of the danger zone in which bacteria present their greatest threat? Let's see if we remember. Okay, um, I well, it's definitely not 0 to 5. I think the danger zone definitely started at 6, and 36 is way too low, so it's going to be, I'd say, 6 to 63 degrees. Does everyone agree? Uh, not everybody. Um, so if we, if I just share those... Quickly, we've got 78% uh, was 6063, and 22% of us actually thought it was 6 to 36, so we could could be surprised here. Nope, okay. it was 6 to 36 degrees Celsius. A colleague is serving food from a hot holding to customers. They've gotten an order wrong, but they can't put the food back into the hot holding because it's been dressed with a sauce and pre prepared for a specific order. What should they do? Should they just pop the food on top of the fridge and give it to the next customer who makes that order, or should they discard the food? Well, it's been taken out of the hot hold, hasn't it? Um, and uh, so I, I think the food is spoiled. So just get rid. I think so. And yeah. um, 80, eighty-nine percent of us all think the same. Um, it should be discarded if it can't be stored properly. The environment on top of the equipment, such as a fridge, isn't a suitable place to store food. Bacteria could breed rapidly and staff might lose track of how long it's been sitting there. This is true. And in summary, guys, remember the four C's. It's about cross-contamination, cleaning, chilling, and cooking. 
and use effective hand washing techniques. Take care of hygiene and employ common sense. And now you're ready for the food safety test. <laughs> but we'll skip that, guys. So pretty much we have our food safety level one. Um, food safety catering level two and food safety retail level two. If those are of interest, as always, please get in touch with us. I can always set up a demo link for you to go through it and do the test at the end user experience. And we would love to know your feedback on our new course. Excellent. Thanks very much, Ellie. That was very interesting. And I actually, I felt like I actually learned something along the way uh, today <laughs> as well, which is great. Um, go wash your hands. Well, particularly for, I, I, you know, obviously this is uh, for a professional environment, but actually there's a lot you can take home with this as well, I think, uh, in terms of, you know, particularly I'm thinking of, you know, when you cook something like a, a fajita and you've got raw chicken and the vegetables, actually that's okay because you're cooking all of those together, but if you're putting a salad with it, that's where you really need to think. Um, yeah. So thanks very much, Ellie. Now next uh, next month we're not going through a course, are we? We're actually going to we're we're launching our new uh, workcraft's new style uh, over the next few weeks. And so Ellie, you're going to be taking everyone uh, with Ryan, our um, workcraft uh, sales manager, as well, to give everyone a, a flavour for what the new style yeah, looks like. Exciting times! It looks great. Very exciting. It does. Very exciting. Good. So hopefully we'll see you all next month as well. Uh, there'll be emails and links on the website to be able to register for that. And in the meantime, I hope everyone has a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Ellie.